All right, everybody, welcome back to Podcast Recovery. We are your host, Eric V. And Carly R. And uh, today we are joined by Jackson. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm having me on. Good, good. And um, where are you from, Jackson? Born and raised in um, New Jersey. Um, Living out in Huntington Beach, Orange County, California now for the past 27 years now. Oh, wow. Awesome. And uh, when were you first introduced to recovery? Um, May 8th, 2015 was um, is my sobriety date. Um, and again, I do like to, um, yeah, I like to really acknowledge and give, you know, thanks for the grace of God for, you know, that date off the other, wasn't a date that I planned. Um, but again, that's the date that I entered this world of recovery and, the journey continues. Awesome. And uh, you, I mean, you answered my next question of, uh, you know, when's your sobriety date? And um, so with all that out of the way, I'll uh, turn it over to you to uh, share your experience, strength, and hope with us. Cool. Thank you. I want to thank you, Eric, um, for having me on and Carly. Thanks again for um, being a part of my recovery as well, you guys. Um, I just think it's important for me to be able to, you know, share my experience, my strength, and my hope with people wherever possible. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, I, I may mention earlier, you know, my sobriety date, it's May um, 2015. And a lot of times you will hear, you know, people will give their sobriety date and, um, you know, they, they speak about, you know, how terrible things got and everything. And um, that's not my story, you guys. Um, I, I consider myself a fully functional you know, alcoholic, you know, um, drugs were, were definitely a part of my story. Actually, that was my primary drug of choice um, is crystal methamphetamine. Um, 21 years um, indulged in that lifestyle, indulged in that substance. Um, I had passed this point of, um, you know, doing it socially and, you know, having a good time with it to complete isolation and, you know, keeping it on a complete down low, but still trying to manage and function, you know, as if I were perfectly normal, you know. And um, May 8th, 2015, um, an event happened where I was um, just come home probably about, you know, six o'clock that morning um, after partying all night and um, got into a little bit of an altercation with my daughter's mother and, um, the police were called out and I was taken into custody for, um, domestic battery. Um, again, the series of events was completely, I thought controlled. I thought I was controlling the situation. I basically kind of pulled everybody in the room and everybody sit down and shut up and, and this is how it's going to be. And basically tried to scare them all into just, you know, calming down. And, um, yeah, that turned into a very, um, scary moment for my for my daughter. She, I just remember her screaming, you know, "Daddy, stop!" And um, that just triggered everything inside of me. And I just remember screaming out, "I can't control myself." Um, after that little event settled down, um, they went off to school. Mom went off to work, and I was at home just like regular routine. And probably about I don't know half an hour hour later. Um, I got a phone call from the county police department asking me to step outside. There's a couple of officers out there that just, they just want to talk to you. (laughs) So I thought to myself, okay, they probably think I got drugs on me. So let's make this quick and simple because I don't have anything. Um, Proceeded to place me under arrest for the domestic battery because um, of the events that happened with the children mother and I and um, again that was um, I remember being taken into custody and I was in tears I was crying because I felt like you know I can't believe they did this get them away from what I was doing and yeah they didn't like it but I understand that I need to have this substance and um, 
it was just like, it was a weird situation because I felt betrayed. And at the same time, I felt like I knew I, I shouldn't be doing this anymore, but I needed it. And I proceeded to you know, be taken into custody. And um, the H&I, I don't know if I could say it, but you know, there was a panel of, of people that come into the jails and um, introduced me to a program of recovery, of which I took, took the book and I basically just started to read that book. Went to my recovery and my rehab center. And I began to explore further, got in it, got a sponsor. And um, I don't know what it changed exactly. All I know is on that date, it was not my agenda to ever stop. I was very resistant to it. Even when I went to my court trial, you know, they were like, we want to give you a rehab program. And I was like, no, I'm here for a domestic battery case, sir. And I was, I'm not here for a drug charge. <laughs> I was like, so like, like, yeah, we understand that, but we think this could really help you total denial, mm. you know, but, um, again, in reading the book, I just started to see myself more and more in this book, no pictures, but you know, I could just see myself, uh, over and over again. And again, I just began to become willing to make some changes and I'd been to five or six other rehabs prior to that. But again, that was just my effort to kind of get control of myself a little bit better because each time it would get a little bit worse, but then I'd re, re, you know, get myself all together, regain everything. And um, that's why I consider myself, you know, highly functional because I could get a little bit crazy, but and I always and I lose control of it, but just my control factor was getting shorter and shorter. Hmm. And I embraced this whole lifestyle of recovery. Um, I knew the cycle would continue, but this particular case, this particular time around, um, I would, you know, proceed to kind of explore. That's exactly what I started to do. I wanted to explore this recovery because heard about it, know about it, but again, I just couldn't do it. I remember many other times I'd get out of rehab and I'd go right back to the connect, you know, four or five months later. And they're like, Oh, Jackson, you know, you look great, man. Where you been? Oh, I've been in rehab. I said, but it's stupid. Recovery thing or that whole sobriety. It's, 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 it's not me. This is what I do. And I go right back to it. Um, so, again, it was just a really weird situation. Why, again, I don't, I don't plan on stopping. I just planned on, you know, getting control over myself better. And then once all the heat was off, so to speak, right back to it. But like I said, the grace of God or something, some type of a miracle happened between May 8th and, um, and where I'm standing is, you know, right now. So, again, that's why I said um, any chance I get to share my experience, strength, and hope, you know, podcast, doing a panel, you know, going into, you know, other rehab centers, I love to take that opportunity to do that because, um, again, I'm just a living, walking testament to the fact that it wasn't my plan to do this. Something happened, and um, my job now, I became willing to be able to, you know, just continue to carry this message of hope. And I believe that that's uh, been a significant part, you know, helping other men, you know, go through a, you know, a 12 step program, um, helping other people whenever, you know, they're discouraged of getting them to a detox, you know, getting them to a rehab wherever possible. Um, again, that's pretty much been, you know, my, my main deal for the past five years. Awesome. That's great. Um, well, we definitely have some questions for you, Jackson. Um, yeah. Carly, would you like to go first or would you like me to go first? You go ahead, Eric. All right. Um, you know, you mentioned H&I and I and you mentioned kind of that meeting coming in, um, you know, for the first time. And how H&I and plays a part in your recovery. Can you describe to me? the importance of H and I like not as just a service commitment to the fellowships, but also how, how does it affect your recovery and, you know, fulfill you? Well, I know specifically at this point, because again, I never even heard of H and I when I was in custody. Um, I did get checked into the psych ward because, um, um, I, I'm diagnosed PTSD, um, substance use disorder. Those are all actual 
um, uh, diagnosis. And so I, I was, you know, put into the psych ward. And when those guys came in, um, I basically just looked at it as an opportunity to just come out and, and just get out of my cell, basically. Mm-hmm. But um, the kindness that I was met with, um, the kindness that I was met with without any type of judgment, um, it was just very relieving. Again, I think it was really something spiritual that happened because it was a lady. I remember she just she just handed me a book, and she's like, here, you can have it. And I'm like, I kind of looked at her like, oh, I can have it? I'm like, usually you, you're, you can't. You know who's going to give you stuff? So she's like, yeah, you can have it. And um, it was just a really significant point to me because again, these people take the time to go into these jails and we're at a place or I'm at a, I was at a place where I was completely defeated, completely defeated. And the H and I people, that hospitals institution, the panel that came in there, um, it, it really, I believe ignited a huge, a huge of hope, a huge level of gratitude anything else I can imagine. As H&I people not coming to that jail at the time and the place where I was at mentally, I would have easily gone right back out, went right through the program and right back into my addiction. I'm I'm 100% sure. So the, the level of gratitude that I have for the hospitals and institution is, it just, it can't be measured at all. Um, I actually um, signed up to be on um, H and I panel here in Orange County. Um, again, I'm still just waiting for the clearance and all that stuff to be able to go into the jails. But um, again, part of my service work will be to you know do likewise and to take this program into the jails because it's a prime opportunity to meet with men at their rock bottom. When you're in a jail, when you're in a psych ward, you know, and you feel like the whole world is against you, those H and I people come in and just basically say, "Hey, look." There's a way out. There's a there's a, there's life after this if I'm willing to follow what's going on. So that's the value of HNI to me. Awesome. Awesome. So I my, my question actually kind of follows up with his. Um. So you did talk a lot about uh, helping others and being of service. So what is it like to be able to give back, and what kind of effect? or impact has that had on your recovery? Um, I think it's probably the single most um, important part of my recovery. Um, but, like, literally, all the other times I went to rehab, you know, I've, I've always thought it's me against the world. You know what I mean? I always thought I got to do this on my own. Okay, I got to learn this. Okay, I got to figure this out. And, and, and I figured that I had to just take it and run it my own. And then I met a sponsor that says, okay, Jackson, now that you understand it, now that you believe it, now that you've gone steps one through 12, okay, and I'd never heard the phrase, you can only keep it by giving it away. And I was like, what the heck does that supposed to mean? <laughs> and I was like, you, you, you got to give it away. All of this, all of the, the testimony of, you know, sharing this, you know, my, my past, I understand now why I went through all that stuff because there's another young man or, you know, a man in general who is going through it and has lost all hope. So here's my prime opportunity, and it completely ignites my spirit. Any chance I get to work with a newcomer, any mm-hmm. chance I get to be able to, you know, make contact, and it's not like I force it. It's like I just I just have this natural, you know, magnet, magnetic draw. You know, like, I don't want to press too much. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not a pressure sales, whatever. But when I share my story and they come to me after the meeting or after, you know, a, a panel, oh, my God, it just, it, it, my spirit just lights up when they say, oh, okay, I want to do the steps. Can you get me through the steps? You know, being able to take a man through 12 steps that completely, I believe it's the single most, single most factor of, of, of the sustaining the sustaining of my sobriety that I have today because each and every time I get to work the steps with another guy helping others in that matter I get to it's a refresh it's like a refresher course every time and it's clear because I need that refresher course because sometimes when I go through the steps again I'm like 
And just by being able to go through it or see it with different eyes, with a different man, it completely recharges my whole recovery all over again. So, um, again, that's my main deal. Again, when I say, you know, helping others, again, it goes, I can extend as far as, you know, other, you know, a whole list of things. But when I think of helping others, my main agenda is I want to get another man through 12 steps. And then from that point, like I said, we'll become friends and he feels comfortable if he's going through something. Or we can kind of do a third step prayer together. And sometimes that's all that's needed. Sometimes a sponsor will just give me a call in the morning. I might be feeling some sort of way. And he'll just text me, good morning, Jackson. And my spirit just lights up. I'm like, God, look at that. There's a newcomer dude. I don't even know this guy. And something motivated him to say good morning to me. And that just lights my spirit. So now... I want to give it back. I want to give it back. So now I'm going to mm-hmm. good morning to him, or I might even text another guy, good morning to him. And it's sometimes as simple as a good morning, bro. <laughs> and the spirit just lights up. So definitely a part of my recovery, helping others. Mm. Awesome. Um, so something I've, something I've been interested in uh, lately with um, our guest is uh, the topic of spirituality and you know, you, you've, you said you've, you've worked the steps and, you know, you've gone through, um, a program of recovery. Now, can you describe kind of where, where were you with your spirituality when you first entered recovery to where you are now? Dark, dark, <laughs> very, very dark, dark. <laughs> Very, very, very dark, uh, and and I, and I don't want to get too far into it. But again, I, I was at the level where um, Eric, uh, uh, Cardi, you uh, guys, um, okay, I always knew for whatever reason. I, okay, I grew up, you know, I always believed in God. Um, I always believed in you know, the Creator. You know, all all of the Bible things. You know, I've always you know had some some level of belief in it. But what had happened was I started to doubt it. Um, mm-hmm. And my, my, my doubt started to show up when, you know, the more I was using, the darker places I was going because I remember many a times I didn't want to be up certain places. I didn't want to, you know, be feeling like it didn't. I'd say, God, can you help me? It was like, where is he? What, what are you doing? How can you let this happen again? And um, my faith was really brought into question um, um, many times. So I started kind of getting curious. I'd jump on the Internet and I'd, you know, look up, you know, spiritual realms, if you will. And those spiritual realms ultimately led me into, you know, exploring, you know, Lucifer. You know, Wiccan, Rastafari, Rastafari. Uh, I can't even say their name, but anyway, just exploring all of the different types of religions because I was trying, I knew that my soul was seeking something and I knew that there was a battle going on. I knew I was a good person, you guys, but it was like that goodness was fading because I wasn't seeing that faith. And I never knew until this 12 step program that I was the one that was blocking it. Mm -hmm. And by, by that, I mean, basically I learned it. You know, my own selfish pursuit. I still wanted to hold on to my own selfish desires. You know, I didn't want to give up dope. I'm not giving up dope. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to put it down. Are you, I need this stuff to breathe. So I figured, I, I learned as long as I'm doing that, there's no way that the good side could ever come through because my choice was, you know, it came down to, as I know it now, God is everything or he's nothing. I pretty much was saying he's nothing. And that's how I would, you know, I was going through life because I didn't see that immediate, I didn't see that immediate response from God like I expected. You know, God's supposed to be on my call, move like this. And when that didn't happen, again, my faith was was definitely, um, um, I, my, I, I doubted my faith altogether. Um, this program um, definitely reignited that, allowed me to reconnect, set aside all those prejudices prejudices that I had before and to reconnect. And again, that spiritual battle still goes on. It still mm-hmm. goes on. But again, this program has definitely allowed me to, you know, continue to improve my spiritual 
you know, contact my spiritual relation. And holy cow, is that the 11th step? Wow, how how interesting that they put that in there. You know, I thought there was a one-time shot. I thought it was a one-time fix. Okay, God saved me. Boom, okay, I'm back to doing what I'm doing. And I didn't realize it was a daily reprieve. I had to continuously, you know, ask for that help and reconnect and ask God to direct my thinking. You know, I, I didn't realize that it was a continuous necessity to improve my conscious contact spiritually. Um, and again, this program really kind of awakened that in me to see, well, look, this is it's not like a weekly, monthly type of a deal. I got to do this on a daily basis. And yeah, that put this program really kind of awakened that. I can definitely relate to a lot of what you just said. Cool, cool. Because, like I said, it was just it was just that area where you know I knew there was something good, and I knew that you know even my the ink I have a monitor, I have like book on my my my, my sleeves are tag out one side. It's like the the skull and the evils, and then the other side is like the crucifix and the uh, uh, word of God. You know. Ephesians six ten scripture on that side. So yeah, I always knew that there was this battle, you know, going in, and I just felt like, you know, I'm not which 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 one am I feeding the most? Well, I was feeding the dark side more than anything. I was feeding the dark side. So of course, as far as the paint, the pictures, so beautiful, it began to show me, oh, God, it's just it's a lie. There's no way you'll ever be able to be perfect. I wanted sobriety. I wanted recovery to be. Per- I thought I was this perfect person, and then. You know, like I said, this program said, look, this is about progress. This is about progress. Thank God it's a spiritual program of progress, not perfection. And that allowed me to kind of <laughs> let down my guard, to let down my guard to say, hey, even if I do slip up, even if I want to hold on to some of my old ideas, you know, he says, hey, just get back on point as quick as you can. And, um, yeah, I had to, I had to learn that, and I'm, I'm continuing to learn it. And every time I get a chance to work with other men, I get to share that part, and hopefully they get to have their own personal experience spiritually as well. Since David wasn't here, I was going to ask a question in his honor. So the one that he always asks is, what's your favorite step? My favorite step? I'm not sure that's a tricky one. I love them all. (laughs) God, okay. Um, That that question has been posed, I think. Okay, so I'm going to really look at this. I believe, personally, I, I like this. Seven step myself personally. Seven step. I had to narrow them all down. I love them all. I really do. Second step, seven step are like the ultimate. Um, my third step is an ultimate go to. But if I had to narrow them down to one, I would say I would, I would definitely have to say yeah, that's humility. So first, see, so what I'm doing is my brain goes to principles. So when I hear steps. You know, how, you know how we're taught, you know, practice these principles in all our affairs, you know? But yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's so interesting. You, you, you'd be surprised. Um, my sponsor, he'd say, name, name three principles. And I'm like, well, there's the steps. They're like, well, well name, some of the, name, name some of the principles of the steps. So I, I, when, when I hear what's your favorite step, my brain goes, what's, what's my favorite principle? I go, step seven. Step seven, I want to kind of get to you just to read it to you guys. Um Humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh-huh. so, so what happens is this, so, and, and and the reason I, I kind of like that is because I, I tied that one to my seven step prayer, and my seven step prayer it has to be humbly as others. I have to be able to get to a point. I got to a point where I realized that my own willpower was insufficient. Okay, so again, all those other steps, again, it requires some willpower, but there comes to a point where all my defects of character, they're going to still show up. Carly, uh, Eric, my defects aren't going to just disappear. So people think, oh, they're all going to go, oh, you're in recovery now, defects are gone. No, my defects are highly active, but they become shortcomings. They become shortcomings once I employ this 12-step program. So, and again, I didn't really have before. So I'm like, okay, I need that seven step prayer because even though I've recognized my defects and I'm willing to you know, let them go, I know they're still going to, I know I'm going to be selfish again. I know I'm going to be lustful again. I know I'm going to be self centered and self pity again. But when they show up, 
You know what I mean? I have the ability now to see them, and now I know that, okay, since I... My creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and... for every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength. I just got chills right now. I'll take a deep breath. Hold on. I just got chills. <laughs> because, again, I have to, I have to be, I have to ask for strength. Again, my own strength, it's good as far as it goes, but sometimes, man, my mm-hmm. defects suit up and show up like a big dog, and I need something greater. I need a power greater than myself to grant me some strength mm. so I can go out here and do his bidding. And that's why I believe that that is so significant because a lot of us will come into recovery, including, you know, of course myself, and we'll, we'll do our best. We'll do our darndest. But, ugh, that frustration and discouragement still comes. That's the time where I need to dial in to that seventh step. That's the time. And again, that to me is what recovery is about, being able to sustain this recovery. And the only way I can sustain my recovery, say you guys, is by remembering, oh, I got I need some more strength. When my battery goes down, when I see that little red light pop up on my on my cell phone, I know I gotta I, I gotta get to a charger. Because again, that, that phone might have been fully charged all day, but when that red light comes on, I got to get to a charging. I got to get to a charging station quick, and that's kind of how I see my life. Some days, yeah. my red light comes on, and I know I got to get to a power greater than myself to give me some strength. And sometimes that just means being still, and that's how I get to get that strength. When I got to plug up that thing, I got to set that phone on the side and leave it there for a minute. And that's how I kind of relate to it. So when you say, "What's your?" favorite step I can because recovery recovery is about okay lack of power that was our dilemma so if lack of power is my dilemma I totally need I need strength cool awesome awesome thank you for sharing that thank you so um yeah Jackson I think I think we're um, about out of time, but, you know, Carly uh, and I would like to uh, thank you for sharing your experience, strength, and hope with us. So, woo! Yeah! Woo! Um, I, I really kind of talk I get, I get really, I get really going for a minute when I feel myself getting it going. I kind of... <laughs> No, I, hey, dude. I get, you know, I'm, I'm super passionate about recovery today because, again, I just know it was never supposed to happen to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. being such a strong willed individual, and you know what I mean? I'm 50 years old now. You know, I spent 22 years, you know, chasing that dope, you know, and chasing that life. And for me to be able to have five years, it didn't have nothing to do with me. I was prepared and perfectly content with dying. A dope thing. I was perfectly content with it. Again, that's just what it was. So, like I said, I have to really kind of gauge myself in this. Um, but again, I really want to get the point across that it's going to take something greater than myself if I want to sustain the sobriety. All I get is today. All we have is today, this moment, actually. And that is so valuable to, to be able to share and to give hope to people that when it does get discouraging, we can always dial into that power greater than ourselves. We can always dial into that that source of strength. It says on page 162, we know you're we know you're 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 tired and you're lonely, but don't forget it says specifically, but don't forget we have just now tapped into a source of power much greater than ourselves. And, and that's page 162. It's all relevant to being able to sustain. You know, this is. This is a lifetime deal, man. And and a lot of kids said you see a lot of people start and stop, start and stop, start and stop. So again, I just kinda of wanna really encourage anybody that's listening to Yeah. Yeah, man. Don't be dick hurt. Yeah. Um and where where can people find you, Jackson? Um, my, my favorite platform is my Instagram platform. It's my stay dot stop. Um, Stay Stop is a um, it's a recovery apparel brand, but um, 
um, that I created when I was in recovery and um, stay not stopped. It's um, full of complete, you know, encouraging, you know, uh, post, um, you know, little, little uh, inspirational uh, quotes that I find here and there. Um, awesome pictures of people in our communities. Um, awesome gear, you know what I mean, that, that bring support and unity and awareness to long-term recovery. Um, again, stay stopped is what it's about. You know, if anybody can stop, the trick is to stay stopped. Nice. Oh, oh. Well, again, uh, Jackson, we would like to thank you for uh, coming on the podcast tonight. And um, just to, you know, anyone out there uh, who listened, please uh, check out, you know, all of our social media content as well as our um, other, our website, YouTube page, uh, Patreon, etc. cetera. But uh, most importantly, guys, everybody out there, stay safe and stay clean. <laughs>